Hey everybody, this is Matt Atkinson, and you're watching Four Gettysburg with Aaron Smith. What is going on, everybody? Thank you guys so much for tuning in to this episode of Forward Gettysburg. As always, I'm your host, Aaron Smith, and I am so excited to be here with you guys. Today, we are talking about one of my favorite actions, one of the places that I think is the most interesting and unfortunately, the most forgotten on the Gettysburg battlefield, and that is Culp's Hill. We are talking about the action that took place here on July 2nd, 1863. As I alluded to in a former video, I wanted to go back, look at some of the videos I made in the past at the very beginning of the channel, and maybe redo them, see where I could have done things better, and maybe do those topics a little bit more justice. So here I am talking about Culp's Hill. So, Let's get into it with a little bit of background information. Come on, you guys know, you guys know Forward Gettysburg. I always gotta start out with the background information. So we are talking about late afternoon, early evening on July 2nd, 1863. Now students of the Battle of Gettysburg will know July 2nd on the left flank of the Union line. James Longstreet is making his famous attack. He's attacking those areas that are frequently visited by people to the Gettysburg battlefield. Of course, we know Little Round Top, Devil's Den, the Wheat Field, the Peach Orchard, South Cemetery Ridge, all those areas, they are coming under attack. Now on this end of the battlefield, this is the Union right flank, of course, Culp's Hill. The action here is going to start around four o'clock in the afternoon. Major Joseph Latimer, the boy major, is going to post 20 guns on Benner's Hill, and he is going to unleash a hellacious bombardment upon the Union line. He is going to strike Cemetery Hill. He's probably going to strike some uh, people here on Culp's Hill as well. However, the overwhelming Union guns are going to absolutely smother Latimer's battalion. He's going to pull his guns back. And staged in that same area of Benner's Hill, we have Edward Allegheny Johnson's division, and he's going to have three brigades. His other brigade, Walker's Brigade, the famous Stonewall Brigade, former command of Stonewall Jackson. They're going to be on the far left flank of the Confederate line, and they're going to be acting pretty much in the capacity of cavalry. Now, we know Jeb Stewart's cavalry still hadn't made it here at that point in the battle. He's probably coming down from Carlisle as we speak. So, Walker's Brigade, they're going to engage some Union cavalry under David McMurdy Gregg there on Brinkerhoff's Ridge. Talk about off the beaten path places of Gettysburg. Brinkerhoff's Ridge is a small ridge line. If you can find Hoffman Road on Google Maps, that's Brinkerhoff's Ridge. And there's going to be some action that takes place there. So Allegheny Johnson is going to have three of his brigades. He's going to have Jones's brigade, a brigade made up of Virginians. He is going to have Williams' brigade, a brigade made up of Louisianans. And then he's going to have George Maryland Stewart's brigade, a mixed brigade. One of the few mixed brigades here for the Confederacy at Gettysburg. Other mixed brigades that I can think of here at the Battle of Gettysburg for the Confederacy include some of the more well-known brigades on the first day. Archer's brigade consisted of Tennesseans and Alabamians and Davis's brigade brigade consisted of Mississippians and North Carolinians. But Maryland Stewart's brigade is going to consist of regiments from three different states. He's going to have North Carolinians under his command. He's going to have Virginians under his command. And he's going to have a regiment from one of the border states, the 1st Maryland Battalion. So here on Culp's Hill, we have the 12th Corps of the Army of the Potomac under Henry Slocum. And they've taken a position running this way all the way up to the top of Culp's Hill. Up there at the top of the hill is going to be some remnants of the First Corps, some of their survivors of the first day of battle here. Some of those regiments are going to include the 6th 
Wisconsin, the 147th New York, as well as the 14th Brooklyn or 84th New York. I'm probably going to refer to those um, interchangeably. They're both the same regiment. So while Longstreet is making his attack on the left flank, General Commanding of the Army of the Potomac, George Gordon Meade, realizes that the left flank is now the most important flank under his command. And he's going to order almost the entirety of the 12th Corps to reinforce the left flank, which is, of course, being assaulted by Longstreet's 1st Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia. So this entire area is going to be stripped of its soldiers defending and one single brigade of the 12th Corps under George Sears Green is going to remain here at Culp's Hill. Now, like I said earlier, Meade realized that his left flank was in trouble. Of course, we know Major General Dan Sickles moved his 3rd Corps forward and that 3rd Corps is now starting to collapse. However, there's some argument to Meade especially from signal officers who saw a large contingent of Confederate troops moving on this area. But nonetheless, almost the entirety of the 12th Corps is gonna head toward the left flank. And elements of that 12th Corps, they're going to actually get lost. They're gonna head to the Baltimore Pike and they're gonna head south across Rock Creek, making it almost to the area that would be the modern day outlets. They are most certainly lost. However, before this move, before the attack on the left flank, before enemy troops were spotted on this flank, the men on Culp's Hill, they are going to dig in. They're going to begin entrenching. They're going to begin reinforcing this area and fortifying it and building breastworks. They're going to mound up dirt. They're going to find stones. They're going to find fallen logs. They're going to fall some logs themselves, and they're going to start building up a formidable breastworks in this area. I'd like to point out, interestingly enough, that remnants of the Union breastworks are still here to this very day. You might see this slight rise here in the ground where a lot of this hay and straw is. These are the remnants of the Union breastworks that were at Culp's Hill. In fact, the Confederates, they're going to become restless. They're going to become anxious because in their positions all the way on the east end of town around Benner's Hill, they can hear the Union soldiers constructing these breastworks. Lieutenant Randolph McKim, who is an aide de camp to George Maryland Stewart is going to say the following. The enemy, as we all knew, were plying ax and pick and shovel in fortifying a position which was already sufficiently formidable. Now, after these troops are stripped here from the 12th Corps and they go on elsewhere to reinforce the line, get lost down near Rock Creek, Brigadier General George Sears Green is going to be left all by himself. And he's going to stretch out his brigade of 1,400 men to cover these breastworks. George Sears Green, interestingly enough, is the oldest general here at Gettysburg. He will be about 62 years old. He's born in 1801 in Rhode Island, and he's going to graduate West Point in 1823, six years before Robert E. Lee. He's going to be an instructor of mathematics at West Point, and he's also going to be an instructor of artillery at Fort Monroe. Sears Green will leave the army in 1836 and he will go on to a very successful career as a civil engineer. He is going to construct railroads. He's going to construct aqueducts. This man is incredibly intelligent and he knows what he is doing. And his past experience as an engineer and as a soldier makes him realize that even with only 1400 men under his command, with the breastworks, on an elevated ground, he has the advantage. So here we are, Joseph Vladimir has just ended his bombardment. It's now five in the afternoon and there's going to be a lull on Culp's Hill. Around seven, 7.30 or so, Edward Allegheny Johnson is going to move his division of Ewell's Second Corps 
into position and they're going to begin to cross Rock Creek. The three brigades making their way, like I said, Jones, Williams, and Stewart's brigade. Jones is going to be on his right flank, followed by Williams, Louisianans in the middle, and George Maryland Stewart's mixed brigade on the left flank. As these Confederate men made their way to this position, they had no idea what was awaiting them on Culp's Hill. Up here on Culp's Hill, the Brigade of New Yorkers, the 60th, 102nd, 149th, and 137th, and the 78th New York, they are awaiting what is coming their way. Their commander, George Sears Green, is a grizzled old fighter, and he knows with the oncoming Confederate advance, they have a fight on their hands. The 78th, they're going to be sent forward as skirmishers and they're going to encounter Johnson's division and they're going to fall back and they're going to take a position between the 102nd and the 149th New York. Now, around 7.30 or so, the Confederates, they'll cross Rock Creek, which acts almost as a moat to this makeshift castle that the Union line has now set up. The two brigades to the north, Jones's Brigade and Williams' Brigade, they're going to cross Rock Creek without much of an issue. However, Maryland Stewart's Brigade, they're going to encounter much deeper water on their sector of the field at Rock Creek, and they're going to struggle crossing two of his regiments, the 3rd North Carolina and that 1st Maryland Battalion. Where they cross will be a little bit easier, and they're going to get across the creek first, and they're going to align on Williams' left. However, the remainder of his brigade, the 1st North Carolina and the 37th, 23rd, and 10th Virginia, they're going to struggle. The water will be about chest high, and they'll have to very slowly make their way across the creek. Williams, Louisianans, they're going to be the first brigade of Confederates to engage the Union line here, and they're going to be fought back. As you can see behind me, there's woods, there's boulders, not to mention it's a fairly steep incline as well as the breastworks, which you can make out in the line here going this way. They're going to be the first to engage the enemy, but they're going to find the attack nearly impossible to make, and they're going to fall back. As this attack is happening, Green is going to send aides off to General Oliver Otis Howard of the 11th Corps posted on Cemetery Hill asking for reinforcements. He is also going to send an aide to the top of the hill to General Wadsworth and elements of the 1st Division which have taken up position on top of the hill to send reinforcements to this area. We are under attack. Wadsworth, he is going to make ready the 6th Wisconsin the 147th New York and the 84th New York. But before he sends any men from his sector of the field down here to reinforce Green, he wants to make sure that no Confederate attack is coming to the top of the hill. Jones's brigade, Jones's Virginians will be the next ones to make their attack. And they're going to attack the middle of the line here. Jones is going to find that with the Union breastworks, there is going to be very few targets to aim at, and his men are going to end up taking shelter behind the rocks and the trees down further at the base of Culp's Hill here. Now, part of the Union line, part of the breastworks that they designed here, they built in headlogs, and a headlog would be a log at the top of the breastworks, and there would maybe be four or five inches of space between the rest of the breastworks, just enough space for a man to point a rifle through get a bead on his target and fire without risking his own head being blown off. Meanwhile, further south of the line here, those elements of Maryland Stewart's Brigade, the 1st Maryland Battalion and the 3rd North Carolina, they're going to have a much easier go making their way. They're going to be within a swale. So behind me, down this small valley, is going to be where that 1st Maryland Battalion and the 3rd North Carolina are going to advance. 
and it's much easier going down here. There's not a whole lot of steep inclines. It's, it's relatively free from boulders, but with enough trees to add protection. However, in stretching out his brigade to fill this line, George Sears Green is going to have the 149th New York posted in this area. And then on that hill, just over there, he's going to have the 137th New York. And as the 1st Maryland Battalion and the 3rd North Carolina make their way into that swale, they're thinking, oh, wow, we're having a pretty easy go of things until they find themselves in a crossfire from those two Union regiments. And now they are in trouble. The rest of their brigade is still having issues crossing Rock Creek. That is very, very slow going on that end of the field for the rest of Stewart's brigade. However, the rest of Stewart's brigade is going to eventually cross Rock Creek and they're going to find themselves south of the 137th New York, which at this point is the far right of the Union line. And the 10th Virginia, they're going to start to weasel their way around the 137th New York's flank. And the 137th New York, they're eventually going to refuse their line. You see, a part of George Sears Green's genius is that in his sector of the line, he is going to dig a traverse. And traverses are fortifications or breastworks or entrenchments that angle with the main entrenchment. They might be at a right angle, a slightly acute or obtuse angle, but they're going to be angles. And oftentimes these traverses are used for supplies. They're used for communication. But the 137th New York, they're going to refuse their line into this traverse to protect the right flank of the Union Army. Colonel David Ireland of the 137th New York is going to order the refusal of his line, very much like a certain manor on the left side of the field on Little Round Top. As those other four regiments, the 1st North Carolina, the 37th Virginia, the 10th Virginia, as they're making their way around the right flank, Wadsworth is finally going to release the 6th Wisconsin, the 14th Brooklyn, and the 147th New York. And they're going to make their way down from the top of Culp's Hill. And they're going to come down here to Green's vulnerable right flank. Meanwhile, on the rest of the Confederate line, the rebels, they're going to regroup. And they're going to come at this a little bit differently. They're going to slowly make their way behind trees pop up, fire a shot, and continue to slowly move forward with a little bit more success than just blindly attacking this formidable position on the Union line. Around this time, the dusk is slowly turning to dark and there's smoke all over the battlefield at this point, and there's going to be a lot of confusion. McKim, aide-de-camp to Stewart's brigade, he is going to lead eight companies of the 1st North Carolina, which they have finally forded Rock Creek. He's going to take eight companies from that regiment to reinforce the 1st Maryland Battalion and the 3rd North Carolina, who is still taking this awful crossfire in this swale here between the upper portion of Culp's Hill and the lower portion of Culp's Hill. However, as they're reaching their comrades, the smoke and the confusion is going to overwhelm them and they're going to fire into their own men. Friendly fire is going to be a common theme here on the evening of July 2nd at Culp's Hill. At this point, the 71st Pennsylvania, in one of the most baffling moves of the entire Battle of Gettysburg, they're going to make their way onto the right flank of Green's line. They're going to come in just to the right of the 137th New York's refused flank. Some authors, some historians say that they were um, attempting to find the positions on Cemetery Ridge held by the 2nd Corps. I would say Cemetery Ridge and Culp's Hill, that is an incredible confusion. 
But still, in one of the most befuddling moves of the Battle of Gettysburg, the 71st Pennsylvania, also known as the 1st California, mentioned as the California Regiment in George Sears Green's official report on the Battle of Gettysburg. They're going to come in that right flank and they're going to fire a few volleys and just as quickly as they came into the action here, they are going to turn around and march backwards and find Cemetery Ridge. The following day, July 3rd, the 71st Pennsylvania, that 1st California Regiment, if you will, they are going to face some of the most terrible fighting during Pickett's Charge. That right flank of Green's Brigade, that refused flank of the 137th New York, the men who were once posted on that lower por portion of Culp's Hill directly behind me and fell back to a traverse just off in this direction, their flank is still unsupported. And now they have the 10th Virginia making their way around their flank and into their rear. However, as the 10th Virginia is making their way around the rear and around the flank there on George Sears Green's right flank, the reinforcements from Howard's 11th Corps are going to make an entrance. They are going to charge the 10th Virginia and stall the 10th Virginia's attack. However, these regiments and elements of Amsburg's brigade saw extensive fighting on July 1st. These men are tired. Their numbers have dwindled down. And though they stall the 10th Virginia, they are not going to be able to make a lengthy stand in that position, and they are eventually going to fall back. Wadsworth's reinforcements, like I told you, that 6th Wisconsin Regiment, who captured over 200 Mississippians of Davis's brigade on July 1st in the railroad cut, they are finally making their way down here. They're going to be followed by that 14th Brooklyn, that 84th New York Regiment, and then the 147th is going to be bringing up the rear. They're going to come down here to Green's right flank and finally secure that right flank from all attack. They're going to finally relieve the pressure that Colonel David Ireland and his brave 137th New York Regiment was facing. And here is where Green's genius comes into the spotlight. Green's men have been fighting this assault for several hours now on this south portion of Culp's Hill. 1,400 men, one single brigade against an entire division under Allegheny Johnson, one of the most feared commanders for the Confederacy. Sure, Allegheny Johnson was missing the Stonewall Brigade during this attack. They were off, of course, as we know, on the Hanover Road at Brinkerhoff's Ridge there, fighting off McMurdy Gregg's cavalry. But still, even without the Stonewall Brigade, whose strength was estimated at about 13 100 men. Allegheny Johnson has somewhere between 4,800 and 5,000 men. And this is where Green's genius pays off. Green, with the foresight to build breastworks, is able to fend off these attackers. Not only that, once his regiments are tired and out of ammunition, He's going to retire those regiments and bring up his reinforcements, being the 147th New York, that 14th Brooklyn, and the 6th Wisconsin. And they're going to fire volley and volley and volley into the Confederates. And once those men are out of ammunition and tired, he's going to retire them and bring up his freshly recharged and refreshed regiments and begin the process all over again. There was a near constant fire upon the Confederates here at Culp's Hill. Absolute genius move by George Sears Green, the oldest general to fight here at Gettysburg. Eventually, the rest of the 12th Corps, after their little delay by Rock Creek and the outlets, they're going to make their way back here to Culp's Hill sometime late in the evening. By this point, 
George Maryland Stewart's Confederate Brigade of Virginians, Marylanders, and North Carolinians. They will have fought against elements of four different Union Corps. They will have fought against elements of the 1st Corps, of course, the 6th Wisconsin, the 14th Brooklyn, the 147th New York. They will have fought against an element of the 2nd Corps in the 71st Pennsylvania. Elements of the 12th Corps, Green's Brigade, and of course, Amsburg's Brigade of the 11th Corps. They will have fought against four different corps of the Army of the Potomac. And through this all, the Confederates, they are able to occupy those lower breastworks of Culp's Hill just behind me here. They will take up positions there and they will spend the night there. Skirmish fire going throughout the entire evening, trying to get just a little bit of sleep and a little bit of rest before the awful slaughter starts up again in the morning. Eventually Walker's Brigade, the famed Stonewall Brigade, they will return from their foray against the Union Cavalry and they will take up positions behind Stewart's Brigade. The evening has now grown dark. Confusion rules the battlefield. Smoke lingers over the land. And Allegheny Johnson, no doubt hearing stories of friendly fire and, and the confusion on this end of the battlefield, he is going to halt any further attacks. Now I'd like to rewind a little bit to the evening of July 1st, 24 hours earlier. Isaac Trimble, who at this point had no command under him. He was just kind of there with the Army of Northern Virginia. He is going to remark to Richard Stoddart Yule, commander of the 2nd Corps, when he's deciding if taking this area is practicable or not. And I quote, if we don't hold that hill, the enemy will certainly occupy it, as it is the key to the whole position. Yule's assault on Culp's Hill on July 2nd has failed. His failure has no doubt cost him very dearly. Tactically, he only holds the lower position of the hill and the cost in human life is even greater. Green's forethought to reinforce this area, which already was a formidable, formidable position Green's decision to turn it into no doubt what seemed like a fortress to the attacking Confederates has paid off dividends unbelievably. His 1,400 men plus some scattered reinforcements, the remnants of some 1st Corps regiments and 11th Corps regiments and randomly the 71st Pennsylvania, they were able to stave off an entire Confederate division under one of the most well-known commanders in the Army of Northern Virginia. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining me today on this episode of Forward Gettysburg. Like I said, I love Culp's Hill. I think it's one of the most interesting parts of the Gettysburg battlefield. And unfortunately, it's one of the most forgotten about parts of the Gettysburg battlefield. In fact, so much so, that the National Park Service does a program on this part of the battlefield called Culp's Hill, the Forgotten Flank. I'm not going to lie, I was going to steal that for the title of this episode, but I decided against it. Curiously enough, once the battle was over, this was one of the most visited parts of the field. The visitors could come here and see the trees torn apart by cannonball and musket fire and mini ball. They could see the breastworks here, the remnants of that terrible struggle on July 2nd and 3rd for this part of the field. However, unfortunately, in popular culture and the mind of visitors, Little Round Top, Devil's Den, that gets all of the glory for July 2nd, rather than this part of the field, Culp's Hill. But with Little Round Top being closed for the next year or so, I implore 
that you guys take the time when you bat when you visit the Gettysburg battlefield to visit this portion of the field where so much fighting happened where so many brave heroics occurred David Ireland refusing his flank the men of the 6th Wisconsin under Colonel Rufus Dahls who had lost so many men during the horrific fighting of July 1st when they were called for reinforcements the only thing that stopped their immediate movement was their commander and yet they still came down here and reinforced the men on this portion of the field thank you guys again so much for joining me as always i'm your host aaron smith for forward gettysburg please if you guys are enjoying the content if you guys are enjoying the channel please like this video and subscribe to the channel things have really blown up within the past two weeks or so and i cannot share with you guys how much i appreciate that how much it means to me that you guys care just as much about the battle of gettysburg the national military park and the gettysburg campaign that you guys care as much about those things as i do as always i'm your host aaron smith and i will catch you on the next one